Five days after U-230 had returned from her mission, I was on an express to Paris, my civilian suit carefully folded in my pigskin suitcase. Upon my arrival, I returned to the hotel near Place de Vendôme and transformed myself into a civilian. It was the first time that I had put aside navy blues in four years. Now Paris lay at my feet. It pulsated with life as I thought life should always be. My desire to bathe in an atmosphere of peace had grown steadily as the war dragged on. I wanted to join the fortunate ones who did not have to worry about tomorrows filled with roaring diesels and exploding depth charges and death in an iron coffin. I wished to forget that I was a cog in the war machine that had spread disaster far and wide. I wished to see life again not as a warrior but as an innocent bystander, and to taste the feeling of complete independence from duty, if only for a day between trains. Only one place seemed to transmit the overwhelming sense of freedom and tranquillity that I desired. Paris. Paris did not disappoint me. It was, as ever, enchanting. I felt the city's spell as people of many nations and eras had felt it. Free of the restrictions a uniform enjoins, I strolled contentedly through the streets and wide avenues, and I knew my disguise was a perfect one when I felt the furtive glances of those Parisian beauties who never condescended to look at a man in uniform. I was entirely divorced from the war for twelve pure hours. I arrived in Frankfurt in blues and spent the evening with my parents and sister. Mother and father showed no sign of strained relations, despite his romance and the ensuing trouble with the Gestapo. But all was not well with Frankfurt. The destruction of the city had assumed grotesque proportions since my last visit in June. Large sections were now as mutilated as Berlin. Father's plant, too, had suffered damages during a recent air attack, and had been only sketchily repaired. I was told that the sixth fire in the attic of his warehouse had been put out only two nights before, and that our apartment building had a minor blaze, too. All these disclosures were depressing, and I felt vaguely responsible for our failure to stop the shipment of American-made bombers that were now pulverising German cities. I was secretly glad that my schedule permitted me to spend only a few hours at home. I departed the same night on a train without lights. We stopped several times in woods and open fields, giving me the dubious opportunity to listen to the deep, long roar of hundreds of Allied bombers traversing the nightly sky. The trip to Berlin became a long, drawn-out affair, and I arrived eight hours late. I crossed the capital underground, thinking of happier times with Marianne. Since her death, Berlin had lost all its attraction. I departed from the city on my familiar route to the Baltic seacoast, but only after another delay of six hours, a second miserable night in a railroad car. The only lights were flashing matches and the glowing tips of cigars and horrible-smelling cigarettes. Smoke and smell filled the overloaded cars. Discussions of the war smouldered everywhere and kept soldiers and civilians awake. I took careful note of the spirit of our people at home, and especially the attitude of our soldiers from the Russian front as they talked of their campaigns. Their belief in victory gave me a certain reassurance that we who fought in the Atlantic could depend upon their holding the Eastern Front. The Allied landings in southern Italy, expected as they had been after the collapse of the Serenaica Front in North Africa, seemed not to disturb our general belief in winning the war. The express pulled into Danzig Station ten hours late. I switched trains and eventually arrived at the naval compound in Gottenhafen one full day late, there was suspense among the submariners who had congregated there to study the first fundamental change in U-boat warfare since the innovation of radar. A seaborne demonstration of the new weapons was arranged for the evening. The bay was black, the night was lukewarm. I had boarded a medium-sized motor ship, which had seen better days as a pre-war transport between German and Swedish ports. When she had reached the middle of the Bay of Danzig, the commanding officer of the torpedo arsenal addressed his guests. We are going to demonstrate the performance of two new types of torpedoes, which will revolutionise the U-boat war. First, we shall show you the destroyer killer T-5, an acoustical torpedo of great potential. Thereafter, we shall demonstrate the new LUT torpedo with its various applications. All torpedoes are battery-driven. For demonstration purposes, they are equipped with luminous dummy heads, so that their course can be followed at night. The motorship increased her speed sharply. 
Minutes later, I spotted a greenish, iridescent light in the dark waters, moving rapidly toward our ship. The vessel turned to port. The light followed. Then we turned to starboard. The light chased after us. The luminous torpedo came closer. The ship was then thrown into a wild zigzag manoeuvre to escape the homing weapon. But the light in the sea followed persistently, reduced distance, then suddenly dashed below her stern. That was the moment when a warhead would have detonated. In our case, the dummy torpedo continued on its track, shot ahead of its target, turned in a circle and attacked the ship a second time, passed below her keel, executed an elegant loop, repeated its snake-like movements and made still another pass before its batteries were exhausted. Then it surfaced like a dead fish, its bright headlight glowing in the black water. This was a stunning performance. Here, I realised, was a weapon that could make the fight against fast destroyers and corvettes a pleasure. Then followed an equally impressive performance. A number of luminous torpedoes traversed the sea, screening and looping. The dark waters were mysteriously swept with numerous lights crisscrossing the mean track of the ship departing, turning, approaching again and repeating the cycle until the torpedo's batteries were drained. Excited by the demonstrations, I pursued the three-day course like a young cat eager to try out its new grown claws. The escort killer torpedo was equipped with a homing device that guided it toward the sound of the target's propeller, or, if a vessel lay motionless, toward her auxiliary engines. It was sufficient to launch the torpedo in the general direction of the target. The homing device found its own way, no matter how violently a vessel tried to outmaneuver it. The second addition to the arsenal had a different purpose. It had become increasingly difficult to approach targets as closely as we had in previous years, and the new LUT torpedo was designed to overcome our inability to shoot at close range. It could be released at a great distance from a convoy, and directed to pursue the target along its mean track, describing a number of predetermined loops of any chosen size, at any chosen depth. A few of these torpedoes, released in a screening pattern, could form an effective barrier ahead of a convoy without forcing us to penetrate its tight defence. I departed from Gotenhafen excited by these new weapons and by reports of others. I had heard of miracle U-boats that were being built in all available shipyards, they were supposed to be capable of staying submerged indefinitely and of performing submerged at very high speed, a speed close to that of our present boats operating on surface. These new submersibles had a retractable tube-like mast with a float, a schnorkel, which would permit fresh air intake and the charging of the batteries while submerged. This device seemed so vital to success and survival that I resolved to find out upon my return to base if one could be installed aboard the conventional U-boat. Continual submergence was the only answer to our problems. For the first time in months, I believed that we were beginning to get the weapons to survive and to risk our lives intelligently. We might yet be around to see the turn of the tide. The sirens were screaming when I arrived in Berlin, and the stench of exploded cordite and smouldering fire was in the air when I departed. The night express to Paris was again unlighted and again packed with people on the run. Europe was burning. Europe was in hectic motion. The front was everywhere. In the cities, in the small towns, in the hearts of frightened people riding the trains. When we were five hours east of Paris, I met Marguerite. She had entered the train in chalon sur marne Since the compartment was darkened, I saw little of her face, but smelled a perfume that was sold in almost every store on Boulevard Haussmann in Paris. At first it was mere courtesy when I offered to stow away her luggage. Then, during brief seconds when the lights of a small station flashed into her face, I saw that she was pretty enough. We fell into a casual conversation, which led to her not-so-casual offer to show me Saint-Denis, her suburb north of Paris. Paris without Saint-Denis, she said, is like wine without spirit. Marguerite showed me Saint-Denis and a great deal more. We spent two wonderful days together in Paris. I wore my civilian suit and Marguerite said she was happy with my French appearance. We walked through the bright streets, through parks redolent of the sullen smell of autumn leaves. Then another night, perhaps my last in Paris ever. I arranged to meet Marguerite the next time I came to Paris. We parted and I went back to my war. The compound in Brest was in a state of shock when I arrived. 
The surrender of Italy had just been announced over the radio and was the topic of heated discussion in the mess halls and the flotilla bar. After the British-American forces had established a beachhead at Salerno, the new government of Marshal Badoglio had ordered the Italian soldiers to lay down their arms, leaving our troops to resist the enemy alone. Fortunately, our battle lines seemed to hold strongly against the northward marching foe, but it was evident that the ring of steel around Fortress Europe was closing ever tighter. The day of my return, the shipyard completed its work on U-230 as scheduled, and I began to fit her out for our imminent patrol. The delivery of new type torpedoes, however, had been slow, and we received only one of the escort killers, eight of the looping torpedoes, and three of the conventional types. I investigated the availability of the schnorkel, but met only astounded faces. No one had ever heard of such a device. However, the martial look of our boat and the heavy armament of eight gun barrels inspired new confidence. These fast-shooting guns, the wonder-working torpedoes, and the newly installed radar detector gave us a fair chance to return to old glory and to port. Monday, October 4th. U-230 set out to sea at dusk. We took advantage of a moonless night and separated from our escort as soon as the cliffs receded into the darkness. We steered a southwesterly course, a straight line into Death Valley. Minutes after we had separated from our escort, our new radar detector recorded the first enemy contact. Instead of diving instantly, we continued running surfaced at high speed, kept our new anti-aircraft weaponry at the ready, and resorted to a new diversion tactic which, we had been told, would be very effective. Riedel, in charge of the scheme, filled a balloon with helium gas stored in bottles affixed to the railing. Then he attached a string of aluminum foils to the balloon and its loose end to a float and tossed the arrangement overboard. The float came to rest on the surface while the balloon rose and stretched the string with the foils until it stood like a full-sized Christmas tree. The decoy rapidly disappeared astern in the ominous darkness. Five minutes later, Riddell repeated the drop, and a second tree floated erect over the waters of the bay. These aluminum trees were supposed to create a stronger image than a U-boat tower on the enemy's radar screen, allowing us to escape in woods of our own making. Unfortunately, two more balloons became entangled in the railing, and three others blew up while being filled with the gas. And in the commotion, the snarled foils made our position amply evident on enemy radar screens. But our luck stayed with us. While Rydell fought with the foils and the balloons, we infiltrated a large French fishing fleet, which gave us more protection than the decoys and the guns. In fact, we discarded the aluminum trees and never used them again. They were more of a hazard than a help. We zigzagged between the wildly scattered vessels for most of the night and made excellent headway. Then we were on our own again, with death waiting for us with a huge harpoon. But the bug worked perfectly. Several times it registered aircraft approaching, giving us ample leeway for our crash dives. Each time the Tommies were left hanging perplexed in the air. As soon as the British realised that we had been equipped with a new radar warning device that actually warned us of their approach, they timed their flights along our projected track so as to force us to dive at ever shorter intervals. As a result, our batteries were down to 70% of capacity at the end of our first night. But, knowing now that the bug was a reliable instrument that gave us a good chance to evade the bombers, we reversed our summer tactic and never exposed our boat to daylight again. The instant we surfaced the following night, the British reacted briskly. Using their radar only occasionally, they surprised us with well-calculated strikes. Hour after hour we repeated the diving Andre surfacing game. Night after night we escaped their canny pursuits and ferocious attacks. On the seventh night the assaults diminished, and on the eighth night we were able to breathe again. U-230 had broken the blockade and sliced her way westward in a phosphorescent sea. During the ninth night, we received orders to head into AK-64 and take up position in an advanced patrol, remaining submerged until the convoy had been sounded out by one of the participating boats. Surfacing was permitted only briefly, for the secrecy of the undertaking had to be maintained at all cost. It was the key to success. At 2035, October 15th, we intercepted a signal with our new antenna, 
designed to pick up radio waves at a depth of 30 metres. Convoy AK-61, course west, surface for attack, U-844. One of the wolves had made contact with the enemy. The trap had sprung. 21 o'clock, U-230 surfaced in time to catch the last faint shimmer of a dying day that we had not seen. Somewhere in the dark north rocked the convoy earmarked for a concentrated assault. As ever, we carried great hopes into battle. A surface attack at night, when all enemy aircraft were grounded aboard their carrier, promised a revival of the old patterns of pursue and destroy. The night was moonless and black. The sea was medium and the wind came out of the west. Occasional showers brushed us on the bridge. 2230. We disregarded feeble radar impulses which went on and off, sometimes disappearing for minutes. Nearby escorts were scanning the surface. 2250. Radar impulses increased in volume and in number. The bug made us nervous, and the reports from below interfered with my firing instructions. I ordered the gear turned off. It was now obvious that we had been detected by the escorts, but the danger of being intercepted was not greater than in any other convoy battle. According to Praga's plottings, we should have made contact with the enemy already, yet there was not a shadow of an escort, not a trace of the convoy. With muttering diesels, we raced diagonally into the long, rolling waves, listened and sniffed the air in hopes of smelling the convoy's smoke before we spotted the ships themselves. It was as if the old times had returned, as if there had been no destructive May, no decimating July, no frustrating August. Once again I savoured the excitement of speeding toward a clash with the enemy in ominous darkness, the sensation of fusing with the ocean and the forces of nature, the drama of defying danger and death. 2350. Borcher detected the first shadows. Escort, bow right, 3,000 metres. The corvette exposed her broadside, but soon disappeared in the nightly haze. Suddenly came the mate's vibrating voice. Corvette, 2,000, bow zero. Siegmund shouted, both diesels three times ahead. Then, Chief, sit on all the pots. An order to Friedrich to squeeze the last fraction of power out of the strained engines. There was not a word about shooting the corvette with our killer torpedo. We had been in tight spots like this many times before. Another shadow emerged from the dark background, bearing 100. Corvette bow left. She moved gradually between our boat and the pursuing destroyer. Siegmann grabbed his chance, turned U-230 to port, and we escaped to the north at nearly 20 knots while the two escorts engaged in wild manoeuvres to avoid colliding. This tactic freed us long enough to make contact with the cargo vessels. It was 015 October 16th. Two, three adjustments for target speed, range, angle. Siegmund drove the boat on a collision course toward the starboard column of the shadowy phalanx of steel, relying on the mate's ability to judge the situation in our wake. I aimed, corrected values, aimed again, and moved the crosshair of the TBT into dead centre of the biggest vessel, then waited. Ten seconds, twenty seconds, thirty, then two fan shots. Four torpedoes escaped their tubes. Siegmund swung his boat around and chased parallel to the convoy, throwing the escorts off the scent. One torpedo hit the larger shadow squarely amidship. A huge flame streaked into the sky, then a loud, sharp report. Seconds later, the shockwave brushed our whiskers. This was the opening signal for the battle. Star shells rose, flares curved and lit up the armada. I waited for the vessel to disintegrate. I waited for other torpedoes to hit, but at the moment of impact the convoy had made a customary turn. Then there was a flash, a second boom tore the night. A volcano erupted, new commotion among the vessels. The sky was turned red and golden by the flames and the slowly descending parachute flares. It was a holocaust such as we had not experienced for all too long. I asked the captain for permission to shoot the killer torpedo. It meant stripping ourselves of emergency defence, but targets did not always come so easy. All right, exec, and make it fast. Siegmund then sent the watch below. I gave the decisive order. Tube 5 ready, angle starboard 90, ready fire. Alarm! U-230 plunged into the depths to avoid being hit by her own homing torpedo. As she balanced out at 120 metres, there was another explosion. Hell broke loose. 
The swishing of speeding propellers crisscrossed the agitated, fuming surface as escorts attempted to catch the attacker. A series of depth charges detonated nearby. Asdic pings surged through depth, but the thrashing of the many cargo vessels' screws and the pounding of their engines covered up our escape and provided the music for our excitement. While the turmoil slowly subsided, torpedo mechanics and seamen worked feverishly to reload the tubes. 310. We surfaced and reloaded. The night was impenetrable. The sea had increased in strength. U-230 bounced hard to regain contact with the fleeing convoy. Suddenly there was a light on starboard, three miles ahead. We turned and crept forward. As we drew cautiously closer, we realised that it was the white beam of a searchlight directed against a sinking vessel. I spotted a corvette lying alongside the doomed ship, taking aboard survivors. We stole toward the scene at low speed and observed it with interest. The incapacitated escort was the easiest target I had had before the tubes. She lay there, only 800 metres ahead, offering her full broadside for a coup de grace. But Siegmund bowed to a merciful impulse and an unwritten rule, and hollered, The hell with these tin boxes, let's get some freighters, left full rudder both small ahead. U-230 turned slowly so as not to divulge her presence. I detected a red light, small and perfectly round moving from behind the stricken vessel, then floating around her. The spot grew rapidly into a glowing red balloon. We suddenly realised that another destroyer had spied us and was in full pursuit, using an infrared searchlight to track us down. Immediately we threw our diesels into high gear and cut into the waves head on. The escort slapped strongly in the mounting sea. Although she listed and bounced severely, she closed the gap with maddening persistence. Siegmund, however, had the slight advantage of dictating the course, and he zigzagged in irregular patterns, driving his boat through the onrushing water walls. From time to time, Siegmund howled into the growing storm. What's the escort doing, exec? She is holding steady, I screamed over my shoulder, unwilling to admit that I should not have fired our killer torpedo. But she was gaining and had grown to the size of a battleship. As the chase went on, however, the wind increased in violence, and the rising waves gave the destroyer a heavy lashing, retarding her more than us. After ninety minutes of desperate manoeuvring, we had lost her in the black mad ocean. 4.45. Two hours before daylight, a new shadow surged into our aft section. We shot forward at high speed, course north, and crashed into the convoy. The shadows were dead ahead. 3.5.10. I whirled around and picked out my targets without glasses. Then everything went very fast. I had had the tubes ready to shoot, aimed at a Liberty ship, pulled the lever, moved the TBT into a second shadow, pulled the lever again. That was as far as I could go. A corvette scurried from behind one of the cargo ships and dashed at us head on. U-230 swerved and surged into the waves on our only getaway course. We had almost completed our arc when a fire column flared into the night. Shockwave and boom hit us simultaneously. The sky was suddenly dyed red. The second torpedo never hit. A new race was on. The destroyer astern surged after us, apparently in a bold attempt to ram us if all else failed. Again, I regretted having used the homing torpedo too early. We repeated our escape manoeuvres for the second time that night, and shook off the threat after an hour of near-deadly sailing. As Siegmund intrepidly steered his boat toward a new attack, I ordered the tubes reloaded. The fight was not over yet. But when a greyish shimmer finally spread over the eastern sky, and the new day separated the water from the clouds, we realised that we were all alone. During the early morning hours, the operation took a sharp turn. Our nightly victories had alarmed the British. Predictably, they sent up everything that could fly, from single-engined aircraft to long-range bombers, to engage in the hunt for the raiders. A ponderous assault from the air was in the making. 8.25. I saw a four-engined plane flashing out of a cloud bank and called the alarm. The boat tilted drastically and plunged into the depths. In the next moments of uncertainty, four savage bursts twisted our boat and reminded us that, in the heat of the battle, we had forgotten to turn on the bug. We outweighted the aircraft and surfaced after 40 minutes, then sailed after the lost targets, our eyes fixed to sky and horizon. 
we picked up a signal. Attacked by destroyer. 57N24W, sinking. U844. No one could help our friends in this raging sea. But by transmitting the site of the tragedy, U844 gave us a clue as to the position of the convoy. 923. Crash dive before a liberator. The hull responded fast to the urgent demands of rudder and hydroplanes. Four depth charges detonated on port. 0945. We surfaced. The sky proved to be empty. 1020. Alarm before a liberator. Four more fiendish explosions followed us into the depths. 1050. Again we surged to the surface and resumed our effort to cling to the convoy. 1112. We intercepted the last call of another of our boats. Attacked by aircraft. Sinking. U-964. My compassion for her crew was replaced by alarm as a plane registered on our radar warning gear. We tumbled into the depths, underdiving the closest blows, then rose again to surface and dashed in search of the convoy. Again and again the pattern was repeated, until the alarms became a blur of countless concussions and exploding bombs. In the late afternoon, another boat flashed the word of her demise. Aircraft. Bombs sinking. U-470. When night settled over the battleground, three U-boats had been destroyed for the four vessels we had torpedoed the night before. It was a close fight eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Ironically, the British had slain the innocents. We, the culprits, were still hunting strongly when a storm forced the aircraft to retreat. Almost three hours after midnight, we intercepted a fresh signal from one of our wolves biting into the flanks of the armada. Attacked by destroyer. Sinking. U-631. A frustrating night ended with four losses on each side. On October 17th, daylight saw the Allies renew their frenzied air attacks on the convoy hunters. The battle raged from dawn to dusk, and it was a totally one-sided affair. We surfaced and dashed ahead in desperate attempts to gain a few miles, only to be forced over and over again into the protective depths. At the end of the second day of the operation, two more U-boats were bombed and sunk. U-540 and U-841 reported being attacked by aircraft, then went down to the bottom. The hunt was over and the toll was great. In all, six U-boats had been lost against four enemy vessels sunk. Ours was the only U-boat of our group to survive. This was the general average of life and death for U-boats in the fall of 1943. Only one out of seven returned from patrol. Since we had lost the convoy while escaping air attacks, headquarters instructed us to sail into BD-62 and await further orders. As we marched toward that southerly position, the weather improved considerably. We travelled with greatest caution, staying submerged as long as there was a trace of daylight and surfacing only in total darkness. In the early morning of October 22nd, we reached our designated square. The temperature had risen almost 20 degrees centigrade in 24 hours and the night was uncommonly calm. The stillness was deceiving, but not to us. We had learned to sense danger like an old bear that had survived the bullets of many a hunter. We had learned that one second of carelessness resulted in death, that danger and the enemy were everywhere. For several days our patience was put to a severe test. Lurking under the cover of darkness, we zigzagged across the surface, observing an area large enough to hold three convoys, and when daylight forced us below, we hid at forty metres, sounded and listened and probed. Then, in the evening of October 26th, came the break. The sound man detected tunes that only a convoy could produce. It was 21.40 when we surfaced. A half-moon shone much too brightly in a cloudless sky. There was no wind. Our boat flew with ease across the smooth, silvery surface, diesels roaring. Dead ahead rocked the convoy, distance less than 6,000 metres. The horizon was strewn with black dots, moving at rigid intervals westward. Three corvettes roamed on port. One was silhouetted on starboard, one glided through the aft quarters. Distances varied greatly. Incredibly, we had surfaced inside the security cordon. Moments later, the escorts swung around one by one funnels fuming, flags of sparks trailing, trying to cut off our assault. Siegmund chased his boat ahead at highest revolutions in a bold attempt to reach the fringe of the convoy, 
before the wildly swerving destroyers had a chance to combine forces. Our irregular dashes from side to side retarded the pursuers, but three hostile shadows drew slowly closer, throwing big bow waves. Soon it looked as if we were trapped, but the firing line was still open, unobstructed, and U-230 leapt forward, reducing the gap to the black monsters rapidly. Suddenly there was the captain's scream. Exec, I give you just 40 seconds to shoot. That was short notice, but I was ready. I corrected range, aimed, counted, then released the four bow torpedoes at short intervals. Our boat listed sharply as she swung on opposite course, and an instant later I lowered the lever a fifth time, firing our last torpedo. That was the fastest attack we had ever made. As five torpedoes propelled westward, U-230 ran away to the east with three escorts in wild pursuit. Their grey superstructures shone white in the glow of the moon. After several hundred pounding heartbeats, there was a series of flashes along the western horizon. Two vessels had been hit, possibly three. Time was 22.25. At once, to our amazement, the escorts, only a stone's throw in our wake, swerved around and steamed after the stricken convoy. U-230 continued at high speed for another hour before Siegmund ordered the crew to secure from battle stations. Three hours after the British had given us another reprieve, Rydal informed headquarters of our situation. Convoy BD-64 course due west. Three hits. Sinking not observed. Four sunk previously total 26,000 tons. All torpedoes expended. Return to base. Following the transmission, we set course toward the Bay of Biscay. Before the first sun rays could unmask us, U-230 withdrew from the surface. The sailing in permanent darkness continued. As we proceeded on surface against the invisible barrier that the Allies had laid across the bay, aircraft attacks increased by the hour. We ran with our decks awash, our bow and stern buoyancy tanks pre-flooded for instant diving, and our hearts in our mouths. Every hour we spent in our nightmarish passage through these dangerous waters was likely to be our last one. During the third night after our clash with the convoy, we shook off a total of 16 bombs. On the fourth night, we dived six times and evaded 24 well-placed packages of destruction. On the fifth night, we were strafed and tormented by 28 bombs. On the sixth night, we dived five times and 20 bombs missed. On the seventh night, the attacks diminished but we ran head-on into a hunter-killer group with our tubes empty. We circumvented the threat, moving slowly, silently, with motors making barely a whisper. Then, clear of the danger, we roared noisily eastward into the night. By the end of the night, we were able to signal that we were only ten hours west of our assigned pickup point. On November 5th, at 9.30, U-230 surfaced, and for the first time in 18 days we saw daylight, Two minesweepers lay waiting for us in the rolling sea near the cliffs of Brittany. One of the vessels blinked us a message by lamp. Air alert. Man your guns. We promptly accepted the advice. Evidently our mission was not yet completed. The hell from above followed us right into port. U-230 eventually came to rest in the concrete shelter in Brest. Only then, with seven metres of reinforced concrete over our heads, were we safe. As I crossed the gangplank and took my first hesitant steps on solid ground, the concrete walkway transmitted a feeling of security through my salt-caked boots into my bones. I took a deep breath, heaved a great sigh of dismay. That was all I could do about our sinking fortunes in the U-boat war. Nowadays nothing went right for us. Even our new, highly praised looping torpedo failed to perform as well in battle as it had when demonstrated under ideal conditions. We now had little ground to lose. Two years before, our battle line had been far out at sea. Last spring, it had moved east to the continental shelf. Now the front had settled at the very coast of France. Many a U-boat which had somehow managed to stay afloat through the weeks of her patrol was sunk in clear view of the shore, just moments before her crew was to step upon the concrete pier. The difference between then and now was dramatically evident in Brest. I noticed many empty berths in the bunker. Back in the spring, three U-boats had been crowded into each one of the bays, and others had to wait their turn outside at the open jetty. I noticed the unusual calm that engulfed the shipyard. 
Not long ago, the yard had bustled with activity as our many boats were serviced 24 hours a day. Not that the boats were off chasing convoys. Only a few remained out there in the Atlantic, and each was conducting her lonely hit-and-run operations, merely to force the enemy to maintain his far-flung defensive system. In October, 24 U-boats had been sunk, most of them under a hail of bombs, the rest under the pounding of new and deadlier depth charges. The result of our own patrol was a surprisingly large contribution to the small total of enemy shipping destroyed by our boats. But the many empty places we found in our mess halls subdued all pride over our accomplished mission. The smell of death was everywhere. My first dinner in port provided me not only with the first fresh vegetables in weeks, but also with more unhappy news. Strohmeyer, one of the staff officers, told me that three of my classmates and close friends had died at sea. Another had perished aboard his boat when an explosion ripped the forward battery compartment. The boat had made it back to port, but my friend had been buried in the Atlantic. Then Strohmeyer slashed me with the news that Gerloff and Goebel, my partners aboard U-557, had gone down with their boats during the summer months. Feeling the brush of death, I wished Strohmeyer a good evening and walked into the adjoining room. At the bar sat a good group of our indestructibles. The night was still young, but their spirits were already soaring high. There was Riddell, sporting a moustache that he had kept as a memento of our many shaveless patrols. There were von Stromberg, Burke and some others. I joined them and drank and sang. As so often happened when we ran out of champagne, patience or ingenuity, we then decided to visit Madame and the girls of the casino bar. Without changing my battle fatigues, I piled into the crowded car and we drove into the blackened city. The casino bar was noisy, smoky and gaily illuminated. Several friends of the first flotilla were already there. They roared greetings and jibes at our boisterous arrival. Madame was charming, as always, and her merchandise was still of a certain quality, which had long distinguished her place from others. Madame greeted me pleasantly, but with a tinge of reproach. Monsieur, we have not seen you for much too long. I hope you have not been mistreated by my girls. No, it was not their fault, it was... I halted, recalling that her house was possibly an allied information centre. It was the tide that had carried me away, madame. She tried to induce me to make my selection, but I had no special plans for that night. I sat at the bar, sipped a drink, listened to the loud phonograph music, watched my friends select their partners. The many girls, the sweet champagne, these stimulated me not at all. Yet stimulation was all we wanted in these unhappy days. I realised that the casino bar had lost all its appeal for me. As the clock finished ringing the midnight hour, the air raid sirens began to scream and my comrades hastened out of the casino bar. They were not intimidated by the bombs. They simply did not want to be trapped in the CB, which would have resulted in less than desirable fame. The sirens were still going strong when a group of us started out through the dark streets of Brest, listening to the heavy flak bellowing in the countryside in the direction of Caisson. Lacking the time to return to the compound, most of my friends took shelter before the bombers arrived over the city. I gazed at the exploding shells in the sky and observed that the main thrust of the Allied assault was directed toward the south of Brest. In the next few minutes, I saw six or seven planes catch fire, fall out of formation and descend in exquisite sweeps, leaving trails of sparks. The greatly improved heavy flak around Brest put on such a spectacular show that I suddenly realised I had forgotten to seek shelter. By then there was no more need for it. The remnants of the air fleet had disappeared. Stirred as we were, nobody thought of going to bed. We joined a group of friends in a tap room for more champagne. But as I settled on a high stool, the door flew open and someone shouted, The Americans are coming! We jumped from our stools in disbelief, though after the Allied landings in Sicily and Italy, anything was possible. However, the young staff officer who had brought the news hastened to add, Don't get nervous, men. I only meant that they are bringing in the American flyers we shot down. Most of them are wounded. Don't you want to see them? The night became more interesting. I rushed over to the nearby naval hospital to see the strangers from overseas. 
The hospital yard was drenched in daylight by numerous bow lamps. Trucks and ambulances pulled into the parking lot, two and three at a time. Orderlies, nurses and onlookers crowded around the vehicles at the entrance. The victims of our flak, some of them badly burned, were delivered on stretchers. Inside the hospital, a doctor I knew permitted me to enter the anteroom. New arrivals were rolled in as soon as some of the Americans were moved out for emergency operations. One of the Yankees, still wearing his leather flight jacket, seemed to be in a better condition than his comrades, but he rolled his eyes and turned his head in agony. As I stepped toward him, I noticed that an ugly but superficial wound ran from his forehead to the neck, neatly dividing his scalp. His haircut was very short, in the Prussian military fashion. Seeing my first enemy at such a close range, I could not resist talking to him and asking him questions. I said in English, You see, that's what you get for trying to hit our U-boat bases. The American preferred to remain silent. I tried again. Does it hurt? He still did not answer. I continued, Tell me, how did you receive this kind of a wound? Now he moved his head slightly, as if surprised that an enemy could take an interest in his condition. Then he said, Well, it happened as I bailed out of my cockpit. My plane was hit, it was burning. The crew had already jumped, but I couldn't get out of the cockpit. The canopy was jammed. I banged my head against it until it broke and flew off. That's how I must have cut myself. How I got to the ground, I can't remember. I was intrigued by his broad American accent, for I had been taught English English. So, I remarked, that finishes the war for you. Aren't you glad about that? Well, the war might be over for me, but it will be over for all you Germans pretty soon. How do you mean that? You heard me. We are going to pulverize your bases and your industry, and in a few months, never mind. Yes, I continued where he had left off. In a few months we will pay you back. Look, I don't know what they have told you about us and our war potential. But one thing I assure you, one day all your planes will fall from the sky and that's the end of your war. I was thinking about our much-discussed new weapons, including death rays and atom bombs, which were now in the development stage. Oh, sure, the American said sarcastically. What happened to your U-boats? Within six months we destroyed most of them. It'll all go the same way. You can't last much longer. I was impressed by his knowledge, but also angered by his arrogance. What you said is nonsense. Who told you that there are no more U-boats? Isn't that the truth? No, it isn't. I am living proof. I just came back from patrol, and I can assure you there are many more boats still at sea, and soon there will be hundreds available, faster and more powerful ones than those at the front. They will sweep your sailors off the oceans. I was somehow relieved by what I had told him, but the Yankee put on a sceptical smile and said, Listen good to what I am going to tell you. One day you will remember it, and that day isn't too far away. Whatever you Germans do, it will come too late. Time works for us, only for us. Convinced that he was a typical victim of Allied propaganda, I clapped his shoulder and said, You will find us Germans not as bad as your newspapers say we are. I wish you a speedy recovery, and one day you will have to concede that I was right. We both smiled at each other, and I left. The Yankees' next stop was the operating table, and thereafter a long rest behind barbed wire fences. When I returned to the compound, it was daylight and too late to go to bed. Instead, I emptied my suitcases, hung my uniform and civilian suit in the closet, and arranged my books on the desk. I selected one of them and tried to read. The effort was not successful, for I heard the American pilot telling me that time worked for them, only for them. I became restless. I turned to the letters I had received from home and read them again. But the voice of the American spoke right out of the lines on the page. The air raids my parents wrote had greatly increased, and one of father's business friends had been killed in an attack. The letters also revealed that Trudy's husband had come home on furlough, and that the two had spent a week in the Black Forest where the nights were still calm and free of raids. These letters reflected the whole truth, the bitter fact that even at home things were deteriorating fast. I heard the Americans saying that time would work for them, only for them. 
Early that morning, I sailed U-230 into the Bay of Brest to conduct various tests. The flotilla's chief engineer was quick in determining and scheduling the bare minimum of repair work to be performed aboard, for the front demanded a fast turnover of the few boats still afloat. Our old workhorse was to be cleaned, gassed, painted and fixed within two weeks, which meant that there was no time to send anyone on leave. For the second time, I investigated the availability of the schnorkel, but there was no man on base who could give me an intelligent answer. Instead, I was informed that we were to receive two improved radar receivers, which were to detect wavelengths in the lower centimetre range, thus keeping us abreast with the enemy's rapid progress in the war of electronics. In our cruel duel at sea, we had been forced on the defensive to such a degree that the Allies dictated the terms and the weapons. On the first weekend ashore, I turned my back to port and boat and boarded the Brest Paris Express late Friday evening. During the night, I went into the washroom and slipped into my civilian suit. By previous arrangement, I met Marguerite under the Eiffel Tower. She wore a blue silk dress with embroidered flowers. I embraced her, then met the eyes of German soldiers jealous of this indiscreet Frenchman. Paris was warm and fragrant, the strong scent of turning leaves, the smell of the waters of the Seine, the breeze-blown traces of perfume all mingled in the limpid air. And above me shone the sun, which I was so often forced to abandon at sea. These were the hours when I imagined that all the bombing and killing was already over, and that I had been spared my inevitable voyage to the bottom of the Atlantic. Shortly after my return to Brest, I was again in blues, and nothing indicated that I had been on a brief journey into another world. The captain was unexpectedly instructed to report to Senior Officer West. We assumed his trip had something to do with our next mission. After a day's absence, Siegmund returned and promptly asked Friedrich, Riedel and myself to join him in his room. He wasted little time. Gentlemen, I am going to make it brief. We have been ordered to break through the Strait of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean. Siegmund paused to observe our reaction. I forced a smile. My partners were grim. It was common knowledge that any attempt to breach the narrows of Gibraltar had only a slim chance to succeed. But what difference did it make where we sailed? It was all the same everywhere. Furious efforts to destroy combined with desperate attempts to avoid being bombed, mutilated and sunk. It was like committing slow-motion suicide. The end was the same. Only the name of the sea would change. However, there was one consolation. If we should be lucky enough to break through the strait, we would be operating in the calm waters of the Mediterranean. To ease the tension, I suggested, it reminds me of some places I'd like to see. The problem is getting there. The captain took the cue speedily. If you, gentlemen, keep the mission an absolute secret, there is a good chance of lying on the beaches of Italy in January. The ice was broken and our conversation grew animated. But then Siegmund took the wind out of our sails. He revealed that two of our boats, U-732 and U-340, had been intercepted in the strait and sunk by the British early in November. Other boats sent out to break through the blockade had been lost even before they had reached Gibraltar. U-566 had been sunk by aircraft on October 24th near the Spanish coast, and the same fate overtook U-966 on November 10th. Nothing had been heard from U-134 and U-535, which presumably had been sunk without a chance to signal. These recent casualties presented us with a clear picture of what we had to face. As we prepared to sail, the odds against us continued to rise. The losses we sustained during the month of November had jumped again. As of November 25th, fully 15 more boats had been destroyed, which nearly ended the existence of our once great and proud Atlantic fleet. All that we had to stack up against the British-American achievement in November was a mere 67,000 tonnes of Allied shipping that our torpedoes had wrenched from small convoys. On the evening of November 26th, U-230 slipped out of Brest Harbour for the last time. She followed in the wake of an escort, past the submarine net and the narrows, then continued out to sea at high speed. We knew that our departure had been kept a secret, for the omniscient British broadcasting station, Calais, which delighted in transmitting bad news in German, 
had no special wishes for us when we sailed. It was near midnight when we changed course to due south and followed the French coast along the 200-metre line of the continental shelf. Instead of sailing into Death Valley, we raced south toward the north shore of neutral Spain. Through the night we were forced to dive three times, but managed to see the first rays of daylight without having received serious blows. Shortly after diving for a day-long submergence, Siegmann, speaking over our intercommunication system, informed the crew of our risky mission. Their reaction was a mixture of surprise and cautious acceptance. They had gone through hell long enough to know the rules of the game. There were other predictable reactions. Many a man who had left a sweetheart in Brest suddenly realised that he would not be able to see her again. Disappointment over the forced separation expressed itself in amusing demonstrations. As I entered the bow torpedo room on one of my regular inspection tours, I noticed a seaman sitting on his bunk with his friends crowded around him. He held up a bra and panties, begged, borrowed or stolen from his girl. His buddies smiled lasciviously and made insinuating remarks. I entered the circle and joined in their laughter. Men with that kind of humour made good sailors. On our cautious voyage to the Spanish shore, we passed badly damaged Lorient during the first long submergence, and in the second night we had La Rochelle on port. When we sighted the lights of San Sebastian, we broke surface, turned westward, and followed the black contours of the high mountains at a distance of four miles offshore. Our track along the Spanish coast remained undetected, and we were treated to a view of the glowing cities of Santander and Gijon. On the fifth night we circumnavigated the dangerous cliffs of Cape Ortegal, and twenty hours later we passed Cape Finisterre, the area where four of our boats had recently been lost. The following night we saw the shimmer of a million lights reflecting in the sky Lisbon. While its citizens went about their nightly amusement, or slumbered peacefully under their quilts, we traversed Lisbon Bay. During the eighth day of our mission, we frequently rose to periscope depth and took bearings on Cape St. Vincent. Shortly before midnight on December 5th, as we approached the Bay of Cadiz on surface, Riddell stepped on the bridge and said nonchalantly, There is a radiogram on your desk. It's still uncoded. Why don't you decipher it? Must be important. With Riddell standing relief, I lowered myself into the narrow drum, took up the code books, then sat down to begin my task. But the message was already decoded. I read headquarters congratulations to Werner and Riedel on our promotion to Oberleutnant. We soon had left Cadiz astern and sneaked ever closer toward the concentrated British defence of the strait. Two hours after midnight, December 6th, we penetrated the Bay of Barbate, the limit of our advance on the European side. We dived and settled U-230 on sandy ground. During the day, frequent depth charge explosions only a few short miles to the east reminded us that the Tommies were determined to prevent passage through the Narrows. While some of the crew rested, and others pretended to do so, I sat with the captain in his corner, plotting the plan of assault. After hours of weighing various approaches, Siegmund finally decided to cut across the triangle toward the North African port of Tangier and proceed from there into the hangman's noose. In the evening of December 6th, the men were ordered to action stations and instructed to stay there for the next three days. At 21 o'clock, U-230 broke through the face of a smooth sea, then hammered with both diesels toward the African coast. Above us spread a dark, clear sky full of brilliant stars. As we emerged from the protective shield of the Spanish shore, radar impulses hit us in rapid successions. Trusting the man at the radar receiver, we continued our dash with beating hearts. Detection volume three! The cry cut through the night like breaking glass. We fell into the tower and the boat plunged into the depths in a single motion. After the roar of the emergency procedure had subsided, there was only silence. Encouraged, we surfaced, but after an eight-mile run, a stubborn impulse forced us below again. At 23 o'clock, we again surfaced, and when no planes appeared, we drove forward. During our run, we packed our batteries with enough electricity to last for three days submerged. We traversed a broad stretch of sea, casting up sparkling fountains which foamed around our hull and left telltale bubbles for miles behind. And yet, incredibly, we remained undetected. 
We surged ahead until the lights of Tangier became visible, then changed course toward the east and the narrow gap between the two continents. Soon we ran into a fleet of African fishing boats and snaked through the flotilla in daring zigzags. Steadily we steered our boat ever closer to the strait. After forty minutes we had passed the unsuspecting fishermen and were coming dangerously close to the narrows, where radar impulses screamed unbearably loud. There was no need for forcing our fantastic luck. We submerged. December 7th. At 045, U-230 began her silent run through the depths. The boat was perfectly balanced at 40 metres and floated noiselessly at a slight down angle, but with a rising tendency. Her speed was set at only one and one half knots, just enough to keep her afloat. But the current, estimated to be three knots at the point of submergence, would boost our speed over ground to four and one half knots. The current was expected to grow stronger the closer we came to the narrows, at which point the peak flow into the Mediterranean was supposed to reach eight knots per hour. I settled myself in the control room to await a day of action. Keisner, our best sound operator, soon detected faint propeller noises and asdic pings dead ahead. There were also strange impulses he had never heard before. With Friedrich at the controls, I stole into the radio room to study the new phenomenon. I put another pair of earphones over my head and listened. I clearly distinguished the familiar insolent asdic pings from the new sound, which Kastner suggested came from a new detection apparatus. The impulses sounded like the whistling and squealing that rubber toys produce when they are squeezed. Suddenly it struck me. That's not a new British gadget, Keistner. Those are dolphins talking to each other. Listen carefully. You can even distinguish their voices. Fascinated, we listened intently to the conversation of the many tumbling dolphins enjoying themselves in the underwater current. Some were at a distance, others nudged our hull, but all of them seemed to like the giant steel fish that had come to join their games. Their palaver increased as we floated deeper into the strait, and so did the Asdic pings. When the first depth charges detonated far off, our squealing companions hastened back into the Atlantic. Above us, a number of British destroyers busily cut the surface in search of intruders. Their activity reached its peak around ten o'clock. Asdic pings showered on us like hail, but fast-moving layers of water of different thermal density laid a protective cover over our boat. Unable to make contact, the destroyers resorted to the old game-throwing depth charges at random. By noon, when I assumed my watch in the control room, the pings had lessened somewhat and wandered off astern. It was evident that we had passed the blockade and the narrowest part of the strait. The turbulence decreased gradually, and by sixteen o'clock Siegmund's patience had run out. He ordered, Chief, bring the boat up to periscope depth and let's see how we have made out. Will be interesting to see Europe and Africa in just one sweep. Care for a look, exec? The captain swung himself into the seat at the scope. He quickly drove around its axis, checking the immediate vicinity. Then he trained it on one spot on port for a while, swivelled to starboard and back to port again. Finally, he said, I think we have the rock already far astern. Let me see the manual. I handed him the heavy volume of the maritime handbook of the Spanish coast, which contained a photograph of the rock of Gibraltar as seen from the sea. Ziegman relinquished his seat, and I aimed the scope at the rock, which rose iridescently from the green water into the azure blue sky. Through the low-lying haze, I counted at least six British warships guarding the entrance into the Mediterranean. I trained the scope to starboard and spotted the North African coast rising almost perpendicularly out of the ocean. On top of the high cliffs near Spanish Cuta, a Civil War memorial projected still higher, and the coast on either side of the monument melted away in the afternoon haze. I was so captivated by the view that I spotted the airplane almost too late to shout, Dive fast, dive to 60 metres, aircraft. I retracted the long scope shaft, then ducked my head and waited. But U-230 arrived at the designated depth without interference from above. I freed the chief from his duty at the controls and took over his task of recording the detonating charges, which by then was purely academic. The boat was engulfed in wonderful silence. The chances of being detected diminished with every mile. At twenty-two o'clock, 
The small light bulb over the captain's bunk was turned off for the first time in twelve days, and the dark green curtain surrounding his berth was closed. Almost twenty-four hours later, at 21.30 the following night, U-230 surfaced and had the lights of Malaga dead ahead. As I emerged from the hatch, I saw the dark mountains looming up behind the illuminated city against a pale sky. The night was so mild that I removed my leather jacket. Then the diesels resumed their wild hammering, and U-230 followed the Black Mountain range. We ventilated the boat and proudly transmitted our first radio message to Admiral U-Boats. Special mission completed. Request new orders. U-230. We expected our vital signal to produce enemy action within the hour, but it did not. Shortly before day dawned, we received headquarters' answer. Well done. Enter Toulon Harbour. Follow route with great care. Extra precaution in front of port. Expect enemy submarines. We had been prepared for a brisk encounter with the Allies, who had established a flourishing supply business between the North African ports and the occupied southern Italian coast. To disrupt that traffic and relieve our front in Italy from the Anglo-American pressure was the ultimate objective of our mission. Therefore, I could not understand headquarters' decision to call us into port unless we were earmarked for a special mission which required briefing. It took us three nights of fast surface runs and a number of crash dives to escape aerial bombardment before we floated into the Gulf of Lyons in the vicinity of Marseille. At one o'clock on December 15th, we informed U-boat headquarters south of our imminent arrival. At daybreak we dived, and Siegmund soon spotted our escort through the scope as she crawled over the horizon. One hour and twenty minutes later, we surfaced thirty metres off port of the nervously cruising trawler. Her skipper requested us to follow her, and a signal by flags told us to be on maximum alert, for British subs had sunk one of our vessels and one of our U-boats two weeks previously. We raced after the zigzagging escort with all hands on deck, wearing their life jackets. At the harbour entrance, a tugboat admitted us, then shut off the entrance by dragging the submerged anti-submarine net from one pier head to the other. We sailed into full view of Toulon. The bright sun shone on green mountains, on the red and green tile roofs of whitewashed houses, on the rusty superstructures of several damaged and grounded French warships. U-230 carefully manoeuvred through the harbour basin, past two sunken French destroyers, past three U-boats which lay unprotected alongside a quay. The captain, spotting a small assembly of men in blues, steered his boat toward the empty place at the quay, and U-230 came to rest parallel to land. What was regarded as a suicide mission had turned into a smooth sail. Our incredible luck still held. The representatives of the 29th U-boat flotilla treated us well. Our luggage had arrived from Brest, and even the mail had been rerouted. Nothing was forgotten to make us feel at ease. I was about to clean out my suitcases when I was called to the captain's room. Have a seat and a cigarette, exec, said Siegmund casually. I've received a teletype from headquarters which tells me that our association has come to an end. You have been ordered to Neustadt to begin your training as commander. Let me congratulate you. Before I could fully comprehend, Siegmund rose and shook my hand and expressed his regrets. That he was losing me. He wished me a better future at sea aboard one of the modern U-boats than he would have with his old U-230. Still surprised, I muttered thanks for my twenty months of service under him, and wished him luck and a new boat too. Then we briefly discussed the immediate problems arising from the changed situation. The greater portion of the boat's company was due for an extended leave, including Friedrich and Riedel. Since my training was not to begin until January 10th, 1944, I was more than willing to take care of boat and crew as a last service and also to spend two weeks in a port which invited exploration. I returned to my room a different man. I thanked the fellow upstairs for having allowed me to survive to this point. I pondered my double promotion and what it would mean, and vowed that as a commander I would do all I could to help achieve victory.